Good morning, brothers and sisters today. What a joy and privilege it is for me to share with you from God's word. Even though we have to meet in our homes today and uh, not, we're not able to gather together in our place of worship, I know and have every confidence that God's spirit abides and dwells with us still. Amen. And I want to just share a brief word with you here today that I've extracted from our scripture passage found in John chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. We read these words. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. But I cannot, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. I want to share with you from the subject I've entitled, End Game. End Game. Won't you pray with me? Gracious God, make me just a nail upon the wall securely fastened in its place. And there upon that nail so small hang a picture of your lovely face so all in this place may know it is truly you here by your grace. Amen. My father passed away just 10 days ago. And as I've entered into the grieving process, I've been reflecting on his life and how he influenced my life. Now, my father used to say, every good and excellent thing stands moment by moment on the razor's edge of danger and must be fought for. Therefore, you must learn how to deal with crisis, son. Learn how to deal with crisis. And then he would say in the words of that old school hymn, in times like these, times of crisis, you need a savior. But I've really been haunted by the fundamental question, what is this life with all these dangerous crises in these dangerous times really all about? And ultimately, what is the end game? And how do we effectively deal with today's crisis? Some of you, in the light of this most recent coronavirus pandemic, have been pondering these same questions. How do we deal with this crisis as individuals, as families, as a community of faith, as people of God? But our real crisis is even bigger and deeper than that. The real crisis is not a crisis of this pandemic. I do declare that the real crisis is a crisis of our own human identity. How do you deal with the crisis of your soul, your life, your identity? In other words, Who's your daddy? 
I promise you, you will deal differently with this crisis, this current coronavirus pandemic, depending on how you identify or who you identify as your daddy. And that's all I came to say to you this day. I'll never forget my father used to say, son, the first thing you got to do to deal with the crisis of life, because every good and excellent thing stands moment by moment on the razor's edge of danger and must be fought for. He says, son, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to be informed. And my dad taught me that in times like these, you must be informed. You've got to know what's going on. You've got to be aware. You've got to have access to information. You've got to have knowledge. He says, son, don't bury your head in the sand. You've got to sit up, look up, and watch to see what's going on in the world. And all he meant by that is that was his excuse to watch the news. He says, you've got to watch the news. You've got to be informed. You've got to know what's going on. My father made sure his three sons knew what was going on in life. At a very early age, he would drill us on academics, reading, writing, and arithmetic. He schooled us in history and philosophy and theology. You know, they don't make fathers like him these days much anymore. But this is the kind of father I grew up with. But most of all, he saturated us in a knowledge of God's word. Oh, yes, he did. I'll never forget how he insisted that I memorize large portions of scripture passages at a very early age. He made me memorize. I'm talking about age six and seven, when I was just a child, he'd made me memorize vast portions of scripture. He made me memorize, blessed is the man, Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. He made me memorize and learn Psalm 8. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings have you ordained strength because of your enemies. He made me learn uh, Psalm 23 by heart at an early age. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside stills waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Those are comforting words for these times, are they not? Very assuring, comforting, and endearing words. I had to learn Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the mountains, the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried away into the depths of the deepest sea, though the waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling thereof. He made me learn Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place. O Lord of hosts, my soul longs, yea, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. He made me learn Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or even you formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He made me learn Psalm 91, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the the, the noisome pestilence, the perilous pestilence, the New King James Version says, uh, that's pestilence, that's coronavirus now. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. He made me learn Psalm 92. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O most high to declare your loving 
kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. In Psalm 121, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. Hallelujah, somebody. We've got comforting words for this time of crisis. And then my father made me memorize and become familiar with many other passages of Scripture from the Bible. Psalm, uh, Matthew 28, verses uh, 18 to 20. The Great Commission, Jesus declares, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. In Colossians 1, 15 to 20. He is the image of the invisible God, Paul says, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And exist, and he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Comforting words for our church in these times. In Philippians 3 7 to 11. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of God, Christ Jesus our Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. In Romans chapter 8 verse 28 to 39 and we know that all things, all things, how many things? All things, all things work together. Mm. If God is for us, let me back up a bit. All things work together for good to them who's, who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, that he might be firstborn amongst many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, thanks be to God, he glorified. What shall we say then? If God be for us, who shall be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who, it is, uh, who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us, therefore, from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, shall persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature 
shall be able to separate us from the love of God. I'm glad that the apostle put any other creature in there because that means none of these creatures running around here today shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Not Batman, nor Superman, not Supergirl. Nobody shall be able to separate us from God's love. Not creatures outside the church, and no creature inside the church can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad this morning? But my father also taught me that it's not enough to be informed in times of crisis. He said, son, you must be conformed. And he taught me to conform my life to God's holy law. He says, you've got to allow yourself to be conformed to obedience to God's law. And so I also had to learn the Ten Commandments. That's right, I learned all Ten Commandments at the age of seven. I know some of you are thinking, man, this man had a crazy daddy. I sure did. And I'm going to try this with my children today. I promise you, I'm waiting for them to hit six and seven. And they're going to learn all of this stuff too. Amen, somebody. You ought to try this with your children. Have them memorize scripture so that they could be informed, saturated with God's word, aware of God's plan, God's goal, God's grace, God's goodness in their lives. But then don't stop there. You've got to enable them to be conformed. Provide them with what it takes to be fully conformed to obedience to God's word, to following in the teachings of Jesus. And my father made sure that I was not only conformed to God's law, but he says, you've got to also conform your life to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm so glad for the precious good news of Jesus Christ, for his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my father says, you've got to be conformed to that life. You've got to come to the place where you surrender your life to his life so that you begin to identify with his life. You identify with his death. You identify with his burial and with his resurrection. And you begin to obey the gospel by being obedient to the cross. Jesus says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. My father taught me to conform my life to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there were some things my father just couldn't teach me. Because not only did I need to be informed and conformed, I needed most of all to be changed and transformed. Amen, somebody. I needed a complete change of identity. In John chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, we read this record of a talk, just a little talk with Jesus that Nicodemus had. The Bible says here that there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher. Come from God, for no one can do these great signs and miracles unless God is with him. He came seeking education, teaching, information, confirmation, God's direction through this man, Jesus, that he met. But Jesus answered and said unto him, Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He came seeking teaching, but Jesus offers him a new birth experience, a total transformation. He came to Jesus by night because he could not come in the day. Some say he was embarrassed to come in the day. He was a Pharisee, you know. He was a ruler of the synagogue. He was a leader and the Pharisee didn't like Jesus, so he didn't want to be aligned with one who is seeking to get teaching from Jesus. He only came looking for teaching. Like me, he memorized the scriptures. He knew 
the scriptures. Like me, he conformed himself to obedience to God's word. But you know, that was not enough. He came to Jesus by night with a poignant question about his life's crisis, the crisis of his heart and his soul. And Jesus explains to Nicodemus that religious knowledge and Jewish ethnicity and moral obedience to the law do not make a relationship with God. They don't make you a child of God. One must be born into God's family by the Holy Spirit. Oh yes, Jesus literally speaks of being born from above. This ancient language simply means being born of God. Born from God as a child of God. The word above was a Jewish circumlocution or roundabout expression for being born of God. That's what it was. Jesus is literally saying to Nicodemus, your escape from your current crisis and your access into God's kingdom lies in your identity as a child of God. And my dear Christian friends, I do declare that is the end game. In the final analysis, whose child are you in this crisis? I promise you will never get safety and comfort and assurance and peace and joy and love and happiness and contentment and rest until you identify yourself fully and completely as a child of God. And that's the end game. In these last days, in the midst of this current crisis, in the midst of this pandemic, whose child are you? You must be a child of God. Jesus is saying it makes no difference who your biological fleshly daddy is. What matters most is that you've been born again spiritually from above, who is your daddy in this life? Nicodemus, you must be born again. It's easy to construe that the phrase born again, it means reborn or rebirthed. And Nicodemus took this phrase quite literally. You know, ancient writers, including uh, Many of the biblical writers often used puns or plays on words in their writing. And Jewish teachers typically spoke of a Gentile convert to Judaism as starting life brand new, like a newborn babe. This was common language in this time. And the adopted sons under Roman law relinquished all legal status and they gave up their former identity when they became their former family. They surrendered it whenever they became part of a new family. Nicodemus, therefore, should have understood exactly what Jesus meant when he said, you must be born again. This was common language, common symbolism and motifs in this day and age. He should have known Jesus was talking about conversion. But it never occurred to him that someone Jewish would need to be converted. He always thought of conversion of, as something that happened from the life of someone who is a Gentile. Gentiles got converted to Judaism. And that was the construct and the mindset and the the context for conversion in these days. Nicodemus had no envisioning of conversion meaning someone Jewish being converted to become a true member of the family of God, being converted to the true faith of Israel, becoming a child of God. Converts to Judaism were set to become as newborn children whenever they were baptized to remove their Gentile impurities 
And so born of water clarifies for Nicodemus that born from above means conversion, not to a physical birth, but to a spiritual one. Jewish teachers, therefore, generally spoke of con converts to Judaism as a newborn only in the sense that they were legally severed and separated from all their former relationships and they actually came to experience a rebirth by the Spirit of God that would produce a new heart. Have you been born again? Are you a child of God? Can you claim God as your daddy? You know, that's the promise in the ancient text in Ezekiel 36, 26, where God promises to give a new heart. God declares, I will take away the old and stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Well, I'm so glad for my father, and I do declare I'm blessed to be his child. I love him dearly, and I look forward to seeing him on that great resurrection morning. But in these last days, facing, facing the myriads of life's crisis, I value more than anything my new birth experience and my identity as a child of God. In the midst of this current crisis, this coronavirus pandemic, with all the noise that's going around, with all the different voices that are talking and speaking, I know you hear them all, all the voices from what is touted as fact and truth to voices from the realms of what is considered conspiracy, from all the voices from the left and the voices from the right, the voices from the Democrats and the voices from the Republicans, all the voices from the religious community and the voices from the political communities, all the noise surrounding this crisis. I hope and pray that you could declare with me today, I am a child of God. Oh, yes, I am. No matter what happens, I'm ready for it because I am a child of God. I have certainty and confidence and a blessed assurance that, yes, I've got an earthly father. My daddy, he gave me life along with my mother. He couldn't do it by himself. But thanks be to God, I've been reborn into God's family, and I am a child of God. That's my identity. That's who I really am. That's who I identify with. That's my connection. That's my source. That's my origin. That's my fundamental essence. I'm a child of God. I've been reborn by the Spirit. I no longer function according to my flesh. And in these last days, God calls us, all of us, male and female, young and old, black and white, rich and poor. He calls all of us to identify as members of God's family in this dark and dismal world. Will you stand up and declare yourself today and always in this society, in this community, in this country, no matter what happens, will you declare that you are a child of God? Will you seek to live your life in accordance with that declaration, with that new identity, with that alignment. If you will, then you can begin to live with trust and faith and confidence and assurance and certainty that God's got his hand in your business and that this whole world, no matter how reckless and crazy it seems right now, God has not abandoned us. God has not forgotten you. God has not ignored you. God has not rejected you. You are still God's child, and God's got you in the palm of his hand. You have no need to fear, no need to despair, 
No need to be frustrated. No need to give up. No need to quit. You can continue to have faith in God and trust. Indeed, you are his child. I know I'm a child of God. How do I know? I'm so glad you asked that question. I know I'm a child of God because, number one, he pays the child support. Oh, yes, he does. He pays the child support. And even now, when everybody's making a run on the, the supermarket, when the stores are emptying out, when, when the stockpiles have gone down low, I promise you, if you trust in him, and if you follow his word, and if you have faith in him, and if you believe, and if you connect with the family of God, I promise all your needs will be supplied. He pays the child support. He's got you. He's going to take care of you. You have no need to worry and no need to fear. I know I'm a child of God not only because he pays the child support, but secondly because he has adopted me. And he calls me his child. He has given me his name. He declares, a new name will I give you. Hallelujah. Doesn't matter what you call me. You could call me bald-headed. You could call me bad. You could call me black. It makes no difference what you call me. All I trust in is what he calls me. And I do declare to you today, he's given me a new name, and it's written up in glory. Hallelujah, somebody, for what God has done in my life. And finally, I know I'm a child of God because he always stops to pick me up when I fall. Isn't that what a good daddy does? He stops to pick you up when you fall. He won't let you Stay down forever. Some of us may stumble and fall. We may get frustrated. We may fail. We may be stressed out. We may struggle sometimes. We may have issues. We may have problems. We may go through conflict. We may face trials. We may face tribulations. We may be tempted. But I stop by to give you this one one little word of assurance that he will stop and pick you up when you fall. He will not leave you alone. He will not abandon you. He will not forsake you. He will not ignore you. He will not forget you. No, 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 never. He never will. I love the words of that old song. In times like these, you need a savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. In times like these, be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle. In times like these, be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. I pray that all of us could testify. In times like these, I have a Savior. In times like these, I have an anchor. I'm very sure, I'm very sure my anchor holds and grips the solid rock. I invite you, won't you just bow your heads with me right now as we pray. Gra gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for your love and mercy, for your goodness and your grace. We thank you, O oh God, that in these last days, as moment by moment we face the end game, 
concern for how do we live in these last times arises. It looms and lingers and it poises itself on the platform of our brains. Sometimes we feel scared, we feel threatened, we feel concerned. In this day and age, in the midst of this widespread global coronavirus pandemic, when so many are running with fear, we thank you that we can find in Jesus Christ a savior. We thank you, O oh God, that you sent Jesus to save us from sin. You sent Jesus to rescue us from the recklessness of this cruel world and to save us. He saves us not only from the penalty of sin 2,000 years ago at the cross, but he saves us from the presence of sin right now through the indwelling presence of your Holy Spirit's power, and then he will ultimately save us from the presence of sin. I thank you, O God, that we can have the comforting assurance of his presence in our lives, dwelling in us through the Holy Spirit. And I thank you ultimately that through that presence we could claim rebirth, new life in Christ Jesus, and that we have been partakers of the life of God. That we are no longer children of Adam, but now we're children of God. And that we can clearly identify God as our Heavenly Father. I thank you for this. I pray for your community of faith. The Temple City Church, Lord, I pray that you'll bless each one. Wherever they are in their homes, bless them. Be especially near and dear to each one today. Every member, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every family. Bless them, O oh God. Fill them with your goodness, your grace, your glory, and your grandeur. Help them to know that they are not alone and that you have not abandoned them. And you still got this world in the palm of your hand and you are in control. I pray these mercies now in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Thank you, Pastor Patisse, for that powerful message. It certainly was guided by the Holy Spirit and drew us closer to Jesus. And thank you, congregation, for tuning in to this broadcast. Until next week, may God bless you. And as always, please reach out to me if you need guidance to get connected to virtual meetings or to find out how to get your ministry up and running virtually. God bless.